Okay, we're, we've got 60 people registered now, so I suggest we start. I, I didn't know that, we did, but as Tariq just said, um, no excuse for being late because you can't say you're stuck in traffic. Um, so I'm Duncan Bowie, I'm chair of the, uh, or co chair, I should say, of the Social Security Society. So I'll be chairing this session. Uh, we're really pleased to have uh, Tariq uh, speaking about his new book. Um, I don't think Tariq probably needs much of an introduction, long-term political activist, uh, historian, novelist, political commentator, and a few other things as well. Uh, so welcome to Tariq. Tariq's going to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have <coughs> time for questions. Um, so can everybody other than Tariq mute themselves while Tariq is speaking? Uh, if you then want to ask a question, um, put, put your hand up. Um, on the reaction system, or if you don't know how to do that, uh, you can wave at me on screen uh, and I'll try and spot you. Um, but uh, please don't try and do that until Tariq's finished, because otherwise it's a bit of putting for our people. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, over to Tariq. <clears throat> thank you very much, comrades, for uh, inviting me to speak to you on my new book on Churchill. Um, first, a word of explanation. Uh, why did I decide to write this book? Well, to be perfectly frank with you, the idea was not mine. It came initially from Mike Davis, uh, whose work you will know is a, a great American uh, West Coast historian. And he said that this uh, critical a, a sharply critical account of Churchill was very much needed because none existed and that he said that I should do it since I knew both worlds, the British world uh, and uh, the colonial world. And I resisted this for some time because I felt there were so many books on Churchill already, there must be good stuff out there. Um, and that in any case, I felt a younger comrade should be assigned this particular task. But then everyone I spoke to said, you should do it. Uh, and uh, then I said, I, I, I said to myself, I will do it. But who am I doing it for? And as I started, um, as I started uh, work, uh, it became clear that many of the books were very narrow minded in their approach. They were either on tiny aspects of his life, the big biographies that were out there uh by the likes of andrew roberts were essentially in my opinion uh, apologies and not serious history books just ideolo ideology rather than actual history of what he did and slowly uh i mean i found two books the roy jenkins uh biography of Churchill was typical Jenkins, you know, curate said, good in some parts, elegantly written, but then reflecting also uh, the late Roy Jenkins's own politics, reluctant, critical, but reluctant to go too far, and ultimately uh, admiring. And then, of course, there's the output of our current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who I think wrote the Churchill book, Looking at the Mirror, uh, because the book is to quite a large extent about bo what Boris imagines himself to be. And some of it is not, it's not unfair to compare himself to Churchill because they shared certain vices. Uh, <clears throat> so the, 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 the so, uh, I felt there was a need for a new book. The best biography, in my opinion, and the most serious one is Clive Ponting's biography of Churchill. This person, as you know, is now deceased, but was a very, very courageous civil servant in the Ministry of Defense during the Falklands War uh, and came out. He became a whistleblower, was tried, for precisely that and for betrayal of the Official Secrets Act and acquitted by a jury. Uh, 
And as a result, he started writing works of history and being a very gifted civil servant, he knew where quite a few of the bodies were buried and went in search of them. And his book is very good. It's sadly out of print. Any decent publisher would put it out again. My book, just to be clear, was never intended as a biography. I didn't want to do that because, as I've said, there, were, there was a choice, a choice available. I basically wanted to have two lines in the book, the political lifeline of Churchill, and at the same time, a historical uh, reflection on the working class as it developed in British society even before Churchill came onto the scene, because ultimately it was these clashes uh, between the rulers of this country and the classes they defended and this new rising working class, which determined a great deal uh, about politics, economics, and much else. So I thought that it would be this is why the title I gave it was His Times, His Crimes. That his times, the times that produced him, uh, were, were uh, extremely important. The readership was for anyone, really. It was written not as a book which is in any sense academic, but as an intervention into a decaying political order uh, which pretends to be stronger than it is. Hence, the hysterical response from uh, Roberts in The Spectator, Simon Heffer in The Daily Telegraph, uh, conservative MPs freaking out in The Sunday Express. Why? I mean, you know, writing a critical book never used to be such a big deal in the past. But we're going through a period where dissent is actively discouraged, where history and philosophy departments, literature departments are under threat, and where they want to reduce large bulk of the British population to become total instruments of what is needed by the state at the moment. And so there is a big assault, in my opinion, on intellectual life in this country. And so that was one reason. And the second reason was that I felt sometimes that the new decolonizers on the campuses, young students challenging the past, needed one or two books, not just mine alone, but at least 10 or 12 books which they could rely on to strengthen their argument. And you can't just understand Churchill by saying he's a racist. Well, he was, uh, but white supremacy was very widespread throughout the Anglo world, uh, <clears throat> not just Britain, throughout the rest of Europe, uh, in the United States of America itself. And there were m most politicians on both sides of the divide tended to that form of racism. Churchill acknowledged it quite openly and theorized it by saying that we do belong to a superior high grade uh, class, uh, the, the whites do, white civilization. And Kipling and others sort of defended it. It was just taken, taken for uh, for granted. I mean, I'll give some few a shock by reminding you that when in his last years as prime minister, when his colleagues were discussing uh, what should be the main slogan, campaigning slogan of the Conservative Party for the 55 election, Churchill said without hesitation, keep Britain white. Now this shocks people today, and so it should, but there were some who were shocked even in the 50s. And uh, though, as they saw the mig migrants desperately needed for British industry and to build and work on the new structures post-war. There was a great deal of nervousness uh, 
uh, for instance, about the Windrush, which was bringing West Indian soldiers in many cases and others from the Caribbean to work here. And Attlee himself, the Labour Prime Minister said, is there no suitable part of East Africa to where we could divert this ship? So I, I, I stress this to try and explain the overall context uh, that existed in Britain, with the British Empire in decline, handing over many of its responsibilities to the United States, but still uh, a period of transition from one form of British imperialism to another. And I therefore thought that <clears throat> it would be best to write about Churchill as the leader, uh, not the greatest Britain that ever lived, but the greatest imperialist produced by the British Empire in the 20th century, or you can say the late 19th century, though it was a joke. And whether he would have been considered a major figure of the 20th century had he not become Prime Minister of Britain at a time when fascism threatened uh, Britain and was taking over the rest of Europe is, of course, an open question. Though he would have been remembered as a very interesting character, but certainly not uh, as the greatest Britain that ever lived or much of this nonsense that goes about. So that's uh, the audience I, I aimed for was a broad audience who genuinely wanted to know who this guy was, what he was, uh, what he was about. The second point I wanted to make, because of the way in which the propaganda on Churchill now exists, you know, over two to three, thousand books, three or four movies, several television shows. And in the introduction to this book, I point out that Richard Burton, the actor who played him in some television series in the 70s, uh, <clears throat> was interviewed by the New York Times. Uh, and he's, and the, the New York Times uh, journalist asked Burton, well, you played Churchill magnificently, but what are your opinions on him? Or, or what is your opinion of him? And uh, Burton turned cold and said, he was a disgusting person, a vindictive toy soldier, and I hated him. And I grew up in the Welsh Valleys, explaining how Churchill was regarded by many, many people in the uh, working class movement. And I'll tell you something just for the personal note, that when I first came to Britain to study, uh, when I arrived, I was quite surprised, to be honest, uh, at the number of people, um, my fellow students, other young people I met, largely from uh, working class or middle class backgrounds, who would say quite casually, oh, my father, my family hated Churchill, or my grandfather, my uncle loathed Churchill. And slowly you began to see and understand why. And then in this book, I wanted to tackle the question is that after all, Churchill isn't the only reactionary conservative politician to have ruled during the times of the empire. Yet why was he disliked the most by people in Britain, leave alone elsewhere? I'm not talking now about the colonies. And the, the answer I've come to is partially psychological, which is that he not only liked to rub the noses of his working class and political opponents in the dust, rubbing British noses in British dust, uh, but did it with delight, boasting about it. Oh, we saw the miners off, we bayoneted their bums and they went back home. Oh, starved them to this. When told that there was a famine in India killing 
and millions were dying. He said, if all these millions are dying, how come Gandhi is still alive? So his style alienated people, you know, whereas someone like Gerson and others were a bit more dignified, if you like, about doing the job they were doing, which was exactly the same as Churchill's. It was Churchill's character, his boasting, which made him hate him. And so during the war years, contrary to what is now presented, Churchill was not popular throughout the war. This is not true. And <clears throat> the work of the soldiers parliament, so-called that took place in Cairo in 1944, showed that the Labour won an overwhelming majority. The Tories came last uh, and did extremely badly, which was the first indication that being popular in propaganda terms uh, didn't necessarily translate into the realities, the social realities uh, of political Britain at the time. So. The, the, the popularity of Churchill was limited. Otherwise, you can't understand how this great so-called supposedly great war hero was voted out in 1945. Um, uh, I, I remember uh, asking Lawrence Daly, a Scottish miners leader and a great autodidact once, I said, Lawrence, why do you, what is your explanation for the defeat, Labour's huge triumph? And Lawrence Daly said, oh, people didn't trust Churchill. They hated him uh, in many parts of the country. And the Tories had created such a terrible mess in the country that the population was neck deep in shit. And they thought that if they elected Churchill, he would make them do press ups. Uh, and <clears throat> Uh, I think this was this was uh, quite quite a strong part of the his unpopularity during the war period, and most people, including the soldiers who came back from Dunkirk, regarded and knew that it was a huge defeat, and the sort of presenting of it as a victory was a triumph for British propaganda. But everyone in their right minds knew it was a huge defeat, and other defeats followed in Tobruk in 1942, in Singapore in 1942, and Nai Bevan, the left-wing Labour MP from Eberville, said in Parliament, don't blame these defeats on the men, on the soldiers, as you are too wont to do. It's the officer class that rules the army. Uh, that is what needs to be changed and altered. It's out of touch. It's uh, aristocratic behaviour. Uh, uh, appeals to no one and people are taking, taken on as senior officers simply because of their class. And Bevan, this was said in Parliament, in the British Parliament in 1942, went further and said, had Field Marshal Rommel been an Englishman or a Britisher, he would never have risen above the rank of a sergeant because he didn't come from the right class. So this attacks, these attacks were being made during the war. So the huge cult of Churchill, largely, not exclusively, was built in the 1980s when he, they needed to revive him uh, for the Falklands uh, expedition. Um, and so Margaret Thatcher began to quote him, take him, the press built him up, uh, there's a lot of sort of, you know, most serious historians agree on that. And then other, the prime ministers who followed Thatcher uh, took him up for their own reasons. Um, Edward Heath said he was a European, which was partially true, not completely true. Um, Blair took him up as a sort of great model for the Iraq war. And so till this day to the Ukraine war where Johnson is using him and where Zelensky uh, 
comes and talks about Churchill, etc., etc. These are uses, ideological uses, that are being made about him. And so these were the reasons I felt that an alternative, uh, alternative history was uh, was needed. The biggest, of course, critique of Churchill that has been mounted is the starving. I mean, there's not enough time to discuss creating the black and tans in Ireland. Uh, Churchill's position was very clear. Anything that troubles the empire should be put down. And, you know, many criminals and thugs were received, released from Irish prisons and recruited into the Black and Tans, as well as people who had fought elsewhere. It was a vicious organization which had the, the authority to kill uh, whenever they felt like it. And the instructions were very clear. I have a whole chapter on Ireland and the relationship uh, with Ireland by various British leaders in, in, in the book. And Churchill was very clear what he wanted and uh, totally opposed to giving, uh, having a united Ireland when it was necessary uh, to do so, something which is still remembered about him in most of uh, Ireland today. The most con one of the most controversial things about the whole Churchill phase is the treatment of Africa. For a long time, this was uh, denied, but Caroline Elkins in Harvard has produced some incredible stuff on the British atrocities and camps in uh, in Kenya, in Kenya. Uh, and elsewhere in Africa, and she's now written a whole new book called The Legacy of Violence, uh, The British Empire Legacy of Violence. So it has been this assault by American historians, usually very good, I have to say, not always, uh, <clears throat> that is beginning to change the atmosphere. And I felt that my book would help to do a similar thing uh, in this country, I obviously knew it would be attacked. That never, it's never bothered me in the past, and uh, and uh, doesn't uh, do so now. So um, those were the main reasons for writing the book, <clears throat> and it covers many parts of things forgotten. I mean, if I were to name three things in the book which haven't been either written about or, or let's say seriously explored one is the churchills uh from the british war office the 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 at, uh, attack mounted on the on this russia after the revolution the so-called expeditionary force Everyone had assumed till recently that there was no problems with that. But we now know, thanks to the pioneering work of an Australian writer, or is he Australian, I, that there was huge dissent inside the expeditionary force that a very senior South African officer, very popular with the men and his fellow officers, and a hero of the First World War, basically mutinied when asked to go and drop chemical warfare on Bolshevik held villages, he refused and said, why are we here in the first place? What the hell are we doing here? And um, at that time, he was so popular that the Daily Express defended him with huge headlines. He went public. Churchill wanted him court-martialed and shot. He was removed. He's a lieutenant colonel, um, had received the Victoria Cross. He was removed, uh, but the military officer sitting on the tribunal refused to sentence him to either prison or leave alone being uh, shot by a firing squad. Uh, he was just removed from the army with a severe rap on the knuckles, died quite young in his early 50s. And there were stories like this, which for me certainly were the first real account of what had happened on that 
expeditionary force. The second was, of course, the brutality insisted upon by Churchill during the, during the Second World War uh, against Greece, where they were extremely embarrassed that the Greek resistance, largely led by communists and socialists and their fellow travelers, dominated by them, might take power after the uh, Allied victories. And they were determined to destroy this resistance, which they did. And the atrocities committed in Greece, very rarely talked about, but horrific, really horrific. And the arguments put forward, I mean, the Greeks could have prevented the British from landing, but they had no idea they were going to be crushed. And Churchill's instructions to General Scobie, the British officer laying siege to Athens, um, was that if there, is, if there is resistance in Greece, treat Athens like a colonial city. This was a resistance which had really fought the fascists both militarily and preserved routes to be kept clear for uh, arms and soldiers to be sent to fight in the desert against the German armies. Uh, but they had also threatened the German occupation of Greece by threatening a general strike if Greek workers were taken and forced to work in German factories. And that activity was so popular that uh, <clears throat> was so popular that it uh, made them heroes. I mean, there is a very fine fine books written on this subject, and this is, of course, usually uh, uh, ignored. Now, Churchill could get away with doing that in Greece because of the Yalta agreements, whereby Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt though in this case it was mainly Churchill and Stalin, had agreed on a division of Europe behind the backs of all the European people involved. So there were Italian and French resistance was told to cool it and work with the uh, uh, conservative governments that were being organized and put into place. And the Greeks, were, Greece was given to Churchill, to the British as their sphere of influence. I mean, it was, from the point of view of the British Empire, uh, crucial. These islands were a very important uh, route to the to 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 the sea route for the British Empire, and they were not prepared to give that over. And Stalin had agreed to this, and so the Greek resistance was crushed with his approval. Had the Russians not been in favor of it, there's no way the British could have uh, taken Greece. And so there were no big campaigns here or in other countries for the Greeks. There were labor MPs, a handful of labor MPs, um, and Nybevan amongst them, who said, what the hell is going on? And uh, when labor won the elections in 1945, the first message sent by Ernest Bevin, the Labour Foreign Secretary to the British Ambassador in Greece was, there will be no change of policy. And a civil war erupted in Greece at that point, which went on till 1949, a pretty horrific civil war in which all the allies, apart from Russia, backed right-wing fascists who had fought with Hitler and some others, liberals who hadn't, to create an army which left that country. Stalin did not help the Greek resistance, full stop. He just didn't. All the help and aid from abroad, as well as British soldiers, were used to help the other side. So in Greece, to this day, Churchill is uh, 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 hated. And I mean, I was astonished to see reviews of my book in some of the Greek press, where it's not been published in Greece as yet, reviewing the English language book. Likewise, in the Arab world, where it's, you know, ma mainstream uh, uh, journals and uh, newspapers have published reviews. So this is clearly of interest.
But what is Churchill's legacy? Churchill's legacy today, quite honestly, it's not this fight them on the beaches and fight them there, which is uh, the Ukrainian uh, moan about, because in reality, the, it never came close to a German invasion. Hitler turned his back on it by stopping the assault on the British Expeditionary Force, which is, which is a story I discuss again in the book. The Germans were on the verge of basically taking the entire British army uh, and take, keeping it prisoner. And Hitler gave General Guderian the order to stop when they were uh, a few kilometers away from the Brits. And the German generals were shocked. And later, when Hitler was asked, why did you stop them? He gave the reason given by some of those close to him was he lost his nerve. He thought we were uh, we would not be able to control things. But the reason Hitler himself gave was that the Brit, in, you know, he could have said it was a strategic error, but he didn't want to admit any mistakes. And he said we were not in a position to run the British Empire which, you know, this is true, of course, but they were not in a position to run the French Empire. They let the Vichy French right-wing uh, uh, Nazi stooges run the French Empire as they had always uh, uh, done before. They allowed the Japanese to take over the British Empire in Asia. Uh, <clears throat> so they could have easily found people I mean, India, they could have handed over to the Japanese because Hitler was discussing that with Hirohito, a big summit in Manchukuo in northern China to celebrate the total crushing of the uh, British and American, uh, um, uh, uh, pro-British and pro-American countries and colonies in that region, and the French because the Japanese had occupied Vietnam as well. So. <clears throat> on that global stake, it was a huge strategic error, and the generals never forgave him for that. Uh, had the British Expeditionary Force been covered, that would have been that. So Churchill's legacy, if you look at it, doesn't add up to too much, except making sure that the Americans were unchallenged and took over the British and the European empires and ran them with the help of the previous colonial powers and that is what has been going on since the second world war i mean if the legacy is this that there's still american troops in germany and japan uh, for instance and in south korea uh, nato has become the sort of strike force of the american empire backed by the Europeans long, long before the, the Putin's imbecility in, in the Ukraine. So the, I, I don't think that there is any such Churchill's legacy is to create a, a new empire of that sort. The Americans do not run their empire as the European colonists did. They tend to find local relays to do it. They don't like long occupations, as, we've, as we have seen in Vietnam, we've seen it in Afghanistan most recently, where 20 years was enough for them and they get out. And they try and find local ruling classes, etc., to do their work for them. So in my opinion, Churchill's legacies for what they were are in imperial administration and Western dominance. And these are carried out not exactly like he did, but he's often paid, uh, paid tribute to them. I think I better stop there because I've gone on for, for, for about 40 minutes. But we can dis discuss some of these things uh, in question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tariq. And, and thanks for keeping, keeping uh, well, well within your time limit. Um, so this does leave us quite a lot of time for questions. Um, so I don't know who wants to go first. Um, put your hands up or, uh, as I say, wave if you can't use the hand up. I've seen Francis King first. 
Actually, Duncan, I, I was just applauding. I was doing the applauding thing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I, sorry. Right, time I, to ask I, a question. Think quickly. Right. I, 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 I've got an observation rather than the, rather than a question about the about the Churchill cult, which I'll just throw in to throw in for the hell of it. The we live in a, a kind of political culture now, which needs heroes. Uh, you know, heroes are, 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 are sort of thing. Every, every political movement feels it needs to have heroes, role models, people you can look up to. And the Conservative Party historically has been very, very short of those sorts of people. There are lots of reasons you can think of for being a Conservative, but kind of selfless heroism and devotion to something higher or greater than yourself isn't normally one of them. And so I'm wondering, how far is the Churchill cult just actually an expression of the need of the political right in Great Britain? They at least have somebody they can <coughs> as, a, as a hero to the, uh, to the masses. Well, uh, the question is that they felt they needed this at a time when the British Empire had virtually disappeared. I mean, the Falklands War, when they revived Churchill, and created his cult as it exists uh, today uh, was something relatively new. I mean, the people didn't particularly need it uh, during the war or even before the war. I mean, there are letters I found in from other sources which are recognized. I mean, there are letters from uh, Churchill was, I mean, just to be clear about that, hated by the Conservative Party. They didn't trust him. They regarded him as a chameleon. They said he all he does is promote his own career. Uh, they mocked him. Uh, <clears throat> when, uh, to give you just one example from my book, when uh, three Latvian anarchists in the East End of London Mm, decided to attack a jeweler's shop to raise money uh, for the anti tsarist struggle back in the Tsarist lands. Uh, they were captured because they'd shot a cop and uh, one of the people working in the place. And there were three of them. Um, they found out, Churchill found out, he was then a liberal home secretary. And he found out that they were hiding in a place at Sydney Street. The police said that they, that they, they had the situation totally under control. There was no problem at all. Uh, but Churchill was told that he should go there by his, you know, uh, flat rows. Because it was the first time that Pathé News was filming in colour. So off he trotted off, dressed up very well, uh, and pretended to take charge of the police operation. And then, when told they were in, the, in a particular building, which the police could have charged, uh, he ordered the troops in. And the artillery was ordered to bomb the building, so these two anarchists were burnt out. And this was regarded as a big triumph against anarchism. Some of this is in Joseph Conrad's novel, uh, The Secret Agent, uh, this whole business. But, um, and then the Tory leader, uh, Balfour, mocked Churchill in Parliament. He said, I know what the police were doing. I know what the news cameras were doing there. But what was the honorable member doing? What was his function there? This is Tories mocking him, uh, a liberal home secretary from that. So they never trusted him. And Ch Chamberlain, even after he was removed, was quite popular. And there was talk of replacing Churchill with Chamberlain, I think in 1940, late 40 or 41. Um, I've got the details in the book. So he was never, never popular inside the Tory party. Uh, even after the war, some of his colleagues got quite irritated with him. So he was, uh, the, that is why I differentiate the living Churchill uh, 
from the Churchill that has been created since the Falklands War onwards. And now, of course, he's used as a household god uh, by the Tories and Labour and the Lib Dems, by all the political parties running the show. I, I don't know what the position of the Scott Nats is on this, uh, but I know that in Wales, not a single Welsh council donated a penny towards building the st his statue uh, 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 outside the Houses of Parliament. That's how much he was hated in that part of the country. So now they use him for these purposes uh, that you say, and the French have made a similar hero out of de Gaulle. Uh, the Germans, of course, can't do that because, uh, for obvious reasons. But these other these other countries um, have done it, and uh, in the United States, Roosevelt is still highly regarded. So, <clears throat> the Churchill uh, cult, as I, as I put it, is a cult developed from the nineteen eighties, and it's now completely out of control actually, which was one reason for, uh, for, for, for doing this book. Uh, thanks. Uh, Simon Forbes, you're next. Yeah, hello. Um, and so, as you say, it's, there's no excuse for being late for Zoom, and I think after this lecture, there's no excuse for buying your book. Uh, to my shame, I haven't done so yet. Um, sounds very interesting. Um, what I want to ask is about your sort of own, own personal um, recollections from the 60s. I mean, just a, a, a brief comment is that um, I actually I grew up as a child in the 70s. My, 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 uh, my mother was a working class Tory, so was my grandmother. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the Churchill cult was definitely alive and well in our house. And I was certainly indoctrinated in, into it. But I was just wondering what the reaction was in 1965, because I think you were still you were in Oxford by that time, weren't you? How, how, how did people um, and because he died, I think, in January 65. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, the atmosphere in o Oxford was that, I'll, I mean, I'll tell you, uh, at the Oxford Union, which was where we all gathered once a week, or many of us, the president proposed one minute silence in memory of Sir Winston Churchill, who has died, which normally would have gone through. No one would have opposed that. So, and then he had asked, as he had to ask, um, is there any opposition? And to my astonishment, a young scholar at Corpus Christi, Richard Kirkwood, who was socialist on the left, um, put up his hand and he said yes and he gave an account of Churchill not dissimilar to the one which I put in the book and he then sat down so we were we had to take a vote on it and I think about 30 of us stood up against observing a minute silence <laughs> which 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 did shock shock people and afterwards uh, you know heated debates began outside the union building but in general by that stage it wasn't a cult but people were prepared to give him his due saying you know at a harsh time he uh, he saved us but the, the honest truth is that the war was Britain, in my opinion, Britain could have been occupied by Hitler had they not stopped the invasion or the capture of the British Army Expeditionary Force at Dunkirk. Hitler knew that, that if they did that, they would then have to do the whole paraphernalia and take Britain, which they could have done. So I don't think there was much that any political leader or party uh, <clears throat> could have done. And the Germans even had a plan to put the Duke of Windsor, as he had then become, back on the throne, and et cetera, et cetera. So they, they had their plan. One reason, serious reason why they didn't, was that at the very beginning of his reign, Churchill said, uh, no, sorry. Hitler called in his chief of staff and his top generals uh, and said, I just want you to know what our plans are. 
the country we hate the most, he used those words, and which has to be destroyed, and which is our priority, and this is our biggest enemy in the world, is Bolshevik Russia. And nothing must come before that. We will take over these other countries just to maintain our backyard, but Russia is the target. And I think Church, uh, Hitler probably also thought that if we delay even further and now spend another six months occupying Britain, uh, that will delay Operation Barbarossa against the Soviet Union for much, much longer. And, uh, and, and that's why he didn't. But the, the, the cult, I mean, there are two very good books by Angus Calder on Britain during the war which are an eye-opener, actually, there on what Britain was like during the war. And he gives both sides of it, a feeling of solidarity against the enemy, but also how lots of work, you know, crime rates went up, anti-Semitism grew to astonishing heights during the war, so much for this being a war to defeat uh, anti-Semitism and so on, which some people stupidly say. So that that's what it was. And honestly, I mean, um, I'm sure there were, just like there were conservative families deeply hostile to Churchill, I have no doubt there were working class families loyal to Churchill, especially during the war. But there were equally, especially in Scotland, and Wales and parts of the Northern England, deep hostility to him as well. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, David, thanks. David Morgan, you're next. Am I on mute? Am I on mute? Yes. Am I, am I in vision? I can't see. We can you are, you are. Yet. Right, thank you, thank you, Tariq. Uh, it's a, a, a great to have, hear you talk. Uh, I'd just like to ask, invite you to say, to say something about Churchill and women, because I know he was quite brutal with the suffragettes. Maybe you could uh, refer, I mean, this, you've got something about that in the book. And uh, also, I noticed reading the book, you do uh, use a lot of literary sources, poetry, uh, li literature, etc. in general. I mean, I'm not saying that, I think that's a good thing because literature and history come together. And maybe you could say something about that. <coughs> you know, <coughs> certainly um, about the suffrage, uh, the, the women question. Uh, yeah, he was he, totally... He was I mean, yeah, he was totally against women's suffrage. He said there's nothing much that needs to be changed. And, you know, women, upper class women can, middle class women can slit their skirts and go on the dance floor. All that's fine. But he said they must be allowed no political role in British society. Uh, their husbands and brothers and fathers uh, taking all the right decisions for them. So he's totally hostile to that and deeply, deeply hostile to the suffragettes, which quite honestly wasn't even a rational bourgeois position to take up because there were other politicians from all the parties, uh, not too many, but there were some who were sympathetic to the suffragettes. Um, and the suffragettes were finally promised by Lloyd George that once the First World War is over uh, and you don't disrupt the things too much, we will consider uh, the vote for women, which is effectively what happened. But not, not on uh, Churchill's part. He remained hostile to uh, that till the end. Uh, as for the... In the question about the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of attacks on jingoism, on the war. It was a sort of very liberating period culturally. Um, Joan Littlewood produced Oh, What a Lovely War, vicious critique of the First World War, whereas now that war, like Churchill, is praised endlessly. It was all the Germans' fault. Just complete arrant nonsense. Um, and uh, The Charge of the Light Brigade, another film produced by uh, Tony Richardson. And there was a lot of plays, Howard Brenton's play, uh, the Churchill play, which was put on uh, by uh, the Nottingham Playhouse and directed by Richard Eyre, uh, was praised widely and then shifted to London. And Harold Hobson, the very state conservative critic, 
of the Sunday Times wrote about that play, he said the most disturbing feature of about the play is that Howard Brenton raises in a very stimulating way uh, the question whether Churchill was the right man to lead Britain during the war. So this degree of dissent, you know, was not unusual, um, unusual at the time. As for poetry and literature, I use that in a, you know, in a lot of my books. I grew up in a culture in Lahore, in, now in Pakistan, where quoting poetry in the middle of conversations was so common. It was part of everyone's culture, not the only the educated or the mm. literati, but ordinary people would do that, which <clears throat> I'm sure to a certain extent happened here as well in the early 19th century, and certainly during the times of the Puritan Revolution and the English Revolution, the number of pamphlets produced, songs written, Milton, for God's sake, well, they were quoted all the time you know, including in speeches. So that has remained with me. And since I also write novels, uh, when I return to writing nonfiction after a spate of novels, uh, it just stayed with me. It's also very revealing. I mean, Yeats's poem on Easter 1916, most people read just four lines. A terrible beauty was born and okay. attack him. Whereas I put the whole poem in, Kipling defending the empire, Bertolt Brecht attacking the empire. So I think in that mix, it helps to explain uh, both the dominant ideology and those who were criticizing it. And it's very helpful. I find lots of people write to me and say, thank you for the poetry, you know, mm. because it's a, it's a way of mingling it with. Yeah, this. it does enrich understanding of history. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Talat Ahmed, you're next. Hi. Oh, thank you. Um, and thanks for a great talk, um, Tarek. I really, I'm really very much looking forward to, to reading your book. Um, I've got a copy, thank goodness. Um, now, my point was just, I suppose, continuing the vein about um, what you're know, so like, where Churchill's um, hero status is rooted in, in terms of being associated with the Second <coughs> World War in Britain, because that status of his is something that's really just got to be punctured you mm. know because to claim that he's the hero of the second world war is just such an insult to the enormous sacrifices that were made across the globe by ordinary working people not least of which in the colonial world itself and obviously i'm thinking particularly of india when i think about the quit india movement when i think about the savagery of the bengal famine when I think about how, you know, ultimately in the lead up to 1947, when the British were compelled to leave India, it wasn't that, you know, out of their choice, Churchill and his ilk had had their way, then the sun would continue to shine on the British Empire. Um, and also like, um, you know, even in, in the theatre of war itself in Europe and also in other parts of the world, um, you know, so like one of the most frustrating and annoying and big lies of the Second World War in the West in particular is where the emphasis is just always on the D-Day landings. The emphasis is just always on Churchill's heroic leadership and what the West sacrificed. Um, and, they, and people forget about the enormous sacrifices that were made on the part of ordinary people. Um, you know, so like the, the numbers of, of, of soldiers that died against Nazi Germany was far, far in excess of anything that we saw in the West. Yeah. Um, therefore, it completely, you know, so sort of like uh, belittles um, the heroism and the sacrifices and what the genuine forces were that led to the defeat of fascism across Europe and the world. Um, and this is something that, yeah, you know, so sort of like it's, it's got to be deeply interrogated and just exposed for the sheer hypocrisy and lies that it is. So, um, yeah, I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. And um, <coughs> Hopefully, looking forward to seeing you in person on Saturday at Marxism in London. Or yeah, London. you will, I hope. Um, the um, one reason why I wrote this book as I did, making it a global history and not just centric 
on Britain or Europe is precisely to convey that it was a world war. It was a world war that started in China with the Japanese uh, Japanese assault on China uh, and started in Europe in 1939. It ended in the, the world war ended in um, Asia as well with the using disgrace, disgraceful use of nuclear weapons against the Japanese civilian population. Uh, <clears throat> so that part of the war is usually left out from accounts here. <clears throat> Most of the big histories of the European histories and US histories of the Second World War, they're getting better now. But for a long, long time, they didn't mention China. And uh, for instance, amongst the atrocities that took place during that war, uh, the worst outside the uh, Judeo side in uh, Europe uh, were in Nanjing, in China, where the Japanese orders given by Hirohito were to teach the Chinese a lesson to end this tradition of Chinese cultural superiority and hundreds of thousands of people were killed women from the ages of 70 down to the ages of six young girls were raped systematically it's one of the worst atrocities of the war and yet hardly mentioned churchill never mentioned it nor do most historians who write about the Second World War. For them, Japan's worst atrocity was taking Singapore, but actually not too many people died in that particular defeat of the British, suffered by the British Empire. It was China which was the principal target, which is why I have a chapter on what happened in Nanjing. And the irony of that massacre in Nanjing is that it was the head of the Nazi party in Nanjing, believe this, our head of the Nazi party and the German community, which was quite large, who wrote a letter to Hitler saying, what our allies are doing in Nanjing is beyond human comprehension. They have to be stopped. And I am giving refuge to as many as we can take in. Uh, Hitler said, well, we can't interfere with what the Japanese are doing. You must behave yourself, etc., etc." But it was registered as to what was going on uh, in Germany, whereas the Kuomintang armies, uh, the right-wing nationalist armies, had just left the city and abandoned the population. And the Chinese Revolution of 1949 who knows who would have succeeded had it not been for the war, whether it had even got that far, we can't predict. So all these uh, uh, elements can't be forgotten. As far as the European war is concerned, it's fairly straightforward, actually. Uh, none of this sort of demagogy, we should fight them on the beaches. You didn't have to fight them in Britain. And the reason you couldn't fight them in Britain was because the two major powers in the world, the Soviet Union, which lost 20 million people, had destroyed the spinal cord of the Third Reich at two key battles in Stalingrad and Kursk. That is where the German defeat began, and that is where Germans began to realize that the war, they couldn't win the war, and started sending out feelers to the Western leaders, which were rejected. And that is what led to the Italian and French Communist parties becoming mass working class parties because of what was happening in the Soviet Union. So, yeah, it's, it's a war whose history has been um, terribly distorted. And uh, it wasn't just one war, you know, there were two wars, Asian war, um, a war in Europe, 
the wars waged by the resistance, the anti-colonial uprisings that took place while the wars were going on, how ultra-nationalists in Asia even allying in British colonies with the Japanese to try and defeat the British. It's a complicated history and it's foolish. Uh, it encourages ignorance to try and cut these elements out from a proper history of the Second World War. I try and offer part of it. My book isn't just about the war, but I, I, I do discuss many of these things in some detail in the biography of Churchill, because you, you know, you can't leave them out. Thanks, Tariq. Um, I can't see anybody else's hand up in terms of wanting to ask a question. We have got quite a bit of time left. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question. Right, Nabosko uh, Milik. Uh, yeah, I, they, I'm getting some questions up. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here, there's uh, Herbert Weiner. Uh, makes the point that Churchill also opposed the Second Front, which extended the Second World War. This is true. It was a huge demand to send in <clears throat> the troops that were being assembled and finally were used in 1945. They were promised regularly every year from 43 onwards, but delayed, and that might have brought the war. It probably would have brought the war to an earlier conclusion had the Second Front been done, but the cynical view of that was let the Russians take it. Uh, themselves, you know, because it was a very cynical opera, Cold War that was also going in at the at the same time. Uh, okay, we've got some questions being asked up to people okay. on the screen. Uh, Naboshka Malikic first. Thank you. Um, I'm um, in uh, Belgrade, in Serbia, former Yugoslavia, and uh, thanking to this uh, discourse that uh, 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 Comrade Ali developed here in, in this book and this presentation, I can just maybe contribute with uh, information about pressure from European Union official uh, memory politics uh, administration that insists, as, as you probably know, on remembrance related to like, let's integrate into European history and memory uh, terrible experiences of fascism and communism equalized. Exactly. Like, totally equalized. Like, I mean, you have really not to be ignorant. You have to be idiot <coughs> equalize that. But this is systematic idiotization, especially in Eastern Europe. And uh, the second thing is that uh, in all these uh, uh, projects, there is insistence of memory to fascism and communism, but not a single word about history of colonialism, not a single word. I mean, and how can you understand fascism without understanding colonialism and imperialism? And then in the end, we just uh, try, like I'm in uh, some activist group and, and we are trying just to, to counter act with the simple definition of second world war as a continuation of colonial wars at the territory of Europe, you know, and this like, unimaginable uh, uh, atrocities that happened here around are just the continuation of colonial atrocities, but now in the territory of white Europe, which is especially, uh, uh, you know, uh, traumatizing. I don't know why, uh, what, is, what is the difference between uh, other... <coughs> okay, that was it, you know, just to contribute. Yeah. This is disaster, I have to say. I mean, younger generations are, are getting totally brainwashed all around in, in Western Europe, they just don't care, you know, but in Eastern Europe, they must like what Ronald ba Ron Bart said about fascism, it is not about just a, a censorship and like forbidding to, uh, uh, to tell something. It is about pressuring to tell something that you don't want to tell. And in Eastern Europe, there is a terror, memory terror over younger generations to equalize communism and fascism and totally forget about colonial history because we are now new colonies, semi-peripheral, but still colonies. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm very glad you intervened, actually, because it's not just in Eastern Europe, though it's the most pronounced there. 
that any attempt to, even in Yugoslavia, where the resistance played in a heroic part in defeating the uh, Third Reich, and in this case, because Churchill had no territorial designs on Yugoslavia, it was not that important. Uh, they, the British admitted it. They said, yeah, we had to help Tito because the other people were close to the fascists. We couldn't help them. Croatia was run by the fascist Ustashi government, many of whose admirers are currently running Croatia and putting up memorials to the Ustashi. And the same is happening in other parts of uh, of Eastern Europe. And this is the one place they are determined to crush the memory of the resistance. I mean, just recently I read in Croatia, they blew up in Mostar, a cemetery commemorating the heroes of the Yugoslav resistance. I mean, I was very proud to visit the caves uh, on Vis, uh, an island, a Croatian island where the resistance used to meet, where Tito's wartime headquarters were. All these memories they're trying to wipe out by this crazed, you know, disgusting equation of the fascists with those who fought them and defeated them. And that is one important reason that an alternative history has to be, uh, has to be uh, uh, kept alive. I think it's extremely important. The, you know, the French resistance, what was it? The French resistance largely, as far as ethnic French were concerned, were working class and intellectual communists and their fellow travelers. But the French resistance as a whole, numerically, the ethnic French represent a small minority as in the whole resistance. Who were they? They were refugees from Mussolini's Italy. They were refugees from parts of Nazi-occupied Europe. They were refugees from the Spanish Civil War. They fought in the French resistance too. And recently historians are beginning to say that. The bulk of conservative France capitulated happily to Hitler. That is, you know, till recently they don't, they didn't like talking about that. But that too is part of history. And De Gaulle was found and promoted uh, as the great leader of the resistance when his supporters were a tiny minority. It's true they fought. They were not in favor of Vichy uh, and they fought, but they themselves were a minority. And their role was built up because their power was going to be handed to them after the Second World War by the Americans and the British, which is what they they did. And so this attack on the history of the past is an attack. It's an attack on historical memory, and that's why we owe it to future generations to at least produce books which record all that and you know i mean uh, i'm not saying we should idealize anyone but at least we have to tell the truth i mean had the soviet union not existed what would have happened the whole of europe would have fallen to hitler roosevelt actually thought at one point that britain was going to collapse and he suggested to churchill send the british navy immediately to american ports so we can keep it safe and Churchill got very angry, but actually Roosevelt was, you know, doing something that wasn't uh, totally negative, saying we don't want the Germans to capture your navy. So it was a very critical uh, situation. And the Soviet Union, I mean, I'm sure if you took a opinion poll on US campuses or British campuses, just take these two countries and say, which country has the biggest contribution in defeating the Third Reich during the Second World War? The majority of Americans will reply the United States. The majority of British will reply Britain and Churchill. The Soviet Union doesn't exist in this, uh, in this memory at all. And this is very serious because if they can do it with such ease on this question, they can do it on many other questions. And then, you know, it's the same in Pakistan. I'm telling you, when I gave a set of lectures in Pakistan, 
I just felt they didn't quite get what I was talking about. And there was an audience of several hundred people. And I said, before I carry on, how many of you knew that before 1971, what is now Bangladesh was part of Pakistan? And about 20 hands went up. These were university students. So it's a, it's a problem in other parts of the world itself. And, uh, you know, soon they won't remember in Yugoslavia that there was once a country called Yugoslavia. I hope this doesn't happen because there are many, many former Yugoslavs who still identify as former Yugoslavs. But it's, 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 uh, it's a huge danger. Thanks, Greg. I'll take Jay Wilberforce next. Uh, then Scott Reeve, and then there's a question on chat from Les Levido. But Jay first. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, first of all, I think there may be a difference between the emergence of uh, sort of the heroic narrative of Churchill in Britain in the eight, as you describe it in the 80s, and his uh, stature in the US, which hmm. I think emerged a lot earlier. Um, with, and I'm speculating sort of, of course, you know, the famous speech, which has always been heavily promoted, and I think in some speech. ways is a good one, um, but also his, his uh, purported role during the Second World War to many Americans. Um, and uh, also, I think his, his autobiography. So I wonder, first of all, if you agree, and if you think, you know, what you think might be explain the difference, if there is one between when he emerged in the U.S., the stature and and in the 80s, as you describe it, in Britain. And the other, I wonder if you'd say a little about his experience and role in both South Africa and Iraq without, you know, taking too much time on it. But I think those are both interesting and, and uh, uh, obviously quite um, relevant. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the... South Africa, Churchill's interest began with the Boer War, where he had to explain how they were fighting a white enemy uh, when they were both from the same higher grade race. And uh, he basically made a defense of the British Empire, saying this is in Britain's interest. It was never, ever in favor of handing over any power in South Africa to any segment of the black population. And, you know, there's uh, no big debate about that. As uh, the British cabinet secretary during the First World War and immediately afterwards <clears throat> in the war ministry, he defended the use of chemical weapons against Kurds in Iraq, said these tribes had to be brought to heel, um, etc. I mean, there's, again, no big dispute about that. About the united states i think he was built up a bit by roosevelt and then there were the radio broadcasts by murrow uh, describing britain as a beleaguered fortress of democracy etc etc which to a certain extent it was uh, but it was churchill who was given the main credit for that whereas you know the fascism itself as a political force was very weak in britain unlike France and obviously unlike Italy uh, and Spain, etc. So the Churchill, memory of Churchill in the United States was um, built up during the war. <clears throat> and there's an episode in my book, which again is something I discovered by pure accident, by reading too much, I guess, is that when Churchill went over, he he wasn't prime minister then to say farewell to Truman at the White House. He was invited and they got a lot of World War II generals along. Uh, and then Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, after dinner said, uh, Winston, we've got a surprise for you. We've organized a war crimes tribunal because, you know, you were very pushy on us using nuclear weapons in Japan. And we're now going to try you for war crimes. Uh, and let's see how that goes. Well, of course, it was a bad taste joke. 
but there was an element of conscience in there that they realized what they'd done to the Japanese citizens it was horrific. So Churchill inquired, he said, well, if I'm going to be in the dock for nuking Japan, what about the president, Truman? And Dean Acheson said, this is the way the world works, he more or less said. You will be in the dock, but the president is the chairman of the tribunal sitting in judgment <laughs> on you. And... Uh, it's uh, it's mind-boggling that this was being done soon after the nuking of um, of uh, Japan, which all the big powers supported. But they've also reveals that there was not unanimity in defending Churchill or taking him too seriously within the upper reaches of the establishment. Roosevelt, he got on Roosevelt's nerves regularly. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And there was, of course, an Anglophile wing of the American um, uh, ruling class. Uh, but uh, there were also more who were critical and didn't totally forget their own clashes with Britain in times, uh, uh, times gone by. And now it's, the, it's just a complete, <clears throat> it's just a complete joke, really, because um, Britain and to Australia, again, two dominantly white states. Uh, I mean, Australia has, was invited to this NATO summit in Madrid. What has it got to do with NATO? It's because how NATO is now used as the striking arm of the United States when it wants to hit, where, where it's possible uh, 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 to use it. But Britain is a total satrapy. You know, it is not a country which uh, has any independence at all. It's uh, military and economic structures, but particularly the security state aspects of it are totally linked up, which is why they are very nervous against any attempt to create an opposition to uh, NATO, which all three political and four uh, main four political parties totally support. So Britain, as an independent part, have nothing except Churchill, whose memory they raise, and then they are very happy when some other politician mentions the memory of Churchill. It's it's not serious, and they know it. It's something they use. Okay, thanks, Tariq. Um, we've got another five questions indicated, I think, so we'll need to keep them brief because we promised Tariq we'd finish by at eight o'clock. Um, so Scott Reeve first. You need to unmute, Scott. We can't hear you. Can okay. you hear me now? Yes. Good. Oh, Tarek. Hi. On that very question, Church's role in the in, in the Second World War, May 1940, if Britain had sued for peace as that Halifax was advocating and uh, that Chamberlain was saying, well, we've got a new alternative, have we? Where are, where are people heard that argument before? Um, if it wasn't Churchill and, and Greenwood and that actually the leader and the deputy leader of the Labour Party, um, 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 Churchill would would have been in a minority of one or two, or, or two, not to, in fact, surrender. And then it became an anti-fascist war, not for Churchill's sake, he was an old imperialist, the great, the great, or the most anti-working class. But the victory of the Nazis in Western Europe would have defeated the organized working class of Britain showing for peace would would the peace of Irish working uh, it would be Yeah. Would be yeah, okay, um, Scott. And you, and you must you won't get also, an answer if you talk when, you talk when you talk about the role of the Soviet Union, you must also remember at that time the um Stalin was in alliance with Hitler. Of course. Of course. In the Nazi Soviet pact. 
and if Britain well, that's it. Otherwise, you're not going to get a reply. Out, would have Russia survived? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look. I broke it. Yeah, these are uh, these are interesting questions. Most of them, I promise you, including the Stalin uh, Hitler Pact, are answered and discussed in some uh, detail in my in in my book. So it's pointless my going into details now because we're approaching the 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 end of this seminar, this meeting. Uh, but. Uh, in terms of the Soviet Union, it was a huge tragedy because let me tell you a story and for the Soviet Red Army and what happened to it, the very great Scottish British economy, uh, historian John Erickson has written three volumes, which I would strongly recommend to those who want to read them. The last maneuvers conducted by the Red Army while General Tukhachevsky was still alive. Uh, they were having war maneuvers in 36 or 37. And Tukhachevsky became the German team and the other Russian generals or some of them became the Russian team. And Tukhachevsky showed them through maneuvers what the Nazis would do, where they would attack, and the best way of defeating them. And the maneuvers were hurriedly brought to an end because no one wanted to discuss issues that were too controversial. This was just before the Hitler-Stalin pact. And then Tukhachevsky and other senior generals were shot by Stalin, and others were imprisoned. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly how the Nazis attacked. So had Stalin not been such a paranoid maniac, the Soviet Red Army, if its high command had not been brutally disrupted, would have dealt with the Nazis long before uh, um, 1945. And that would have been a shock for many people, both in Germany and in um, and in uh, 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 the rest of the world. The one point I didn't make in, in my talk, which I should have made, is this, that both in terms of Italian fascism and Spanish fascism, Churchill was a staunch supporter of Italian fascism and Mussolini very openly and saying that we don't need these fascists in Britain because we can manage the situation. There is no big communist threat. But in Italy, where there is a threat of working class revolution, the fascists are the best people to deal with it because they're extra parliamentary, something that normal conservative parties can't do. So Churchill's support for Mussolini, I also discuss in some det detail in my book, and then his close relations with Franco. Throughout the Spanish Civil War, Churchill made no secret of the fact that he wanted Franco to win that war. Um, and so his hostility to the Germans was largely because he felt that we can't uh, do a deal with them uh, because they threatened the British Empire, whereas he argued that Spain and Italy didn't. He was wrong on that, by the way, but never mind, that's another discussion. Uh, so Churchill, at a crucial point, felt that Britain wasn't rearming quickly enough to deal with the German threat. By the time of Munich and Hitler's total disregard of Munich, all the central political leaders in Britain had realized that a war was inevitable. But don't forget also that there was a great hostility amongst ordinary people to another war. The memories of the First World War were very strong in the British population, and many remembered what had happened then. Uh, and they didn't want to go into another war, war that soon. I mean, Hitler, after all, had started his campaigns in 1933, taken back the Rhineland, 
victimize the Jews. Why didn't anyone speak up for the Jews in 1934, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and throughout the war? Not a single mention by Churchill or any of the other war leaders of safeguarding the Jews, which now has become part. I mean, this idiot Blair at one point said the Second World War was a war fought to save Jewish lives. This he said while he was supporting NATO's war in Yugoslavia. I mean, this is crazy. If that's the criteria you award, if you say that that war was fought to save Jewish lives, you have to say we suffered a terrible defeat. Okay, uh, I mean, we, we still got four more four questions. I don't know whether we've got time to squeeze them well, all in. So very uh, yeah. brief questions and probably brief answers, Gary. Um, so there's a question on, on chat I said I'd take earlier. Les Levidow, what are the spaces available and necessary to context the dominant narrative of Churchill? Well, the space doesn't exist, but we make it, you know, by writing, by making sure that arguments never go unanswered on the social uh, networks. I mean, the tragedy is that we're living in times where the media itself often reminds you of living in a one party state, you know, where the liberal press has basically gone to sleep on many, many issues, and the right-wing press is quite rampant. Uh, and there are not many spaces left, and there have to be spaces that we find. We have to dig for these spaces as best we can. Soon, I'm sure, within the next 10 years, if things carry on like this in terms of what's happening to the Western world, they will start imposing restrictions on publishing houses. I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be totally surprised. I mean, one of the recent literary editors of The Guardian, for instance, was asked by a senior, I won't name names, was asked by a senior Guardian person, your why are you reviewing so many verso books now when questions like this start being asked uh it just shows the state of the of the liberalism okay, herbert weiner oh yes uh now what i find significant is churchill's uh one he was anti-semitic to an extent because he wrote this article in the, I believe, the Illustrated London News, saying there were three kinds of Jews. One was the Jew that supported the Israel state of Israel, also a person who was loyal to Britain. But then there were the Soviet revolutionaries, like Trotsky, etc. And these were the Jews that you had to watch out for. And also, the Sorry, fact what is your that question? Oh, the question is, are, are you aware of Churchill's anti-Semitism that was thinly cloaked uh, with his prejudice against left-wingers who were Jewish? Yeah, uh, I am not only aware of it, Herbert, there is a section on this in my book on Churchill's attitudes towards Jews and, uh, and, and Zionism in general. Uh, uh, basically, both Hitler and Churchill were horrified by what they called the Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy. And Churchill used to say that had it not been for the Jews, the Russian Revolution would not have been made. He blamed the Jews, like Hitler did, for the Russian Revolution. I mean, to call that grotesque is a very mild form of criticism, but it's appalling. But yeah, that was his position. The only Jews he trusted were the Zionists, uh, because they were going to take solve the Jewish problem by taking Jews out of Europe uh, <clears throat> and into the Middle East and create a state which could help the British Empire. That's how Churchill viewed it. And in his big interview with the um, with a Labour paper, actually, the Sunday Chronicle, he outlined all this very clearly in the 20s, I think. But all this material you're talking about and asking for is actually in my book. OK, um, Mads Peterson. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm calling from, uh, 
I'm from Copenhagen. I'm head of the Labour History Society in Copenhagen. Um, my question is, um, uh, I'm going to spend my summer vacation with you and Churchill. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but a quick question is, uh, what in our present time do you see has fertilized the, the, the ground for this um, uh, Churchill cult that has developed? Uh, I can say that even in Denmark, there is a, a, also a Churchill cult. Uh, among especially um, uh, people from the right-wing press that has uh, um, uh, found Churchill on the back shelves of their library uh, uh, and put him forward again. What, what in our time do you think has fertilized the ground for, for a, 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 another cult of uh, I think what it is, is the new wars that have been fought from 82 onwards, and particularly after 9-11, that you need a war person to, um, uh, uh, in, in the English language world, in the English world, and Scandinavia, they all speak English as well as a second language. Uh, they need leaders who they can use. Look, he's a good guy because he fought the Nazis. This is what he said. This is what we're doing today in Iraq, in Libya, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, in the Yemen. We're following the same pattern. And it's, of course, totally, I mean, there's an element of truth in it. But these new wars are being fought for a very clear reason which is the preservation of American imperial hegemony, backed by the European Union uh, at that time. Uh, and even in, um, when I look at Scandinavia, I mean, the uh, German joke used to be, it took us uh, a weekend to take Denmark. It took us a phone call to make Sweden neutral but the bloody Norwegians fought on for weeks. <laughs> and, and that was, you know, I mean, it is a, a, a funny way of saying what the reality was. What I didn't have time to go into this book is um, that the Swedes in particular, under a social democratic government, were quite loyal to the neutrality and collaborated with the Germans on many, many levels. I remember I was once uh, some decades ago in Lund, where they were observing the 500th anniversary of the university. And at the, uh, they had asked me to give the public uh, lecture. And afterwards, over dinner, a very senior professor said to me, Tarek, uh, the vice chancellor, you should ask the vice chancellor, the chancellor to explain to you our relations with Nazi Germany. So I said, uh, you tell me, I, I don't want to, you know, he's talking to us. He said, and the table fell silent because they had heard him say, he said, did you know that this university, which we are celebrating today, invited Goebbels, to come to Lund University and receive an on, they wanted to make him an honorary fellow of the university. And he said it was Goebbels who refused and wrote back to them and said, behave yourself, you're meant to be neutral. Don't engage in this thing, it, it's not clever. Thank so. You, um, there's a question in chat from Alberto Pantaloni about, uh, Churchill's support for Mussolini's fascism, and then mm -hmm. we'll take Riyad Akbar as the last question. Okay. Have you been able to find it? Churchill saw Mussolini's fascism as a good solution to counter communism. Oh, sorry. I. I, uh, I uh, <clears throat> Ah, the relationship between Churchill and Mussolini. Churchill as a go yeah, 
absolutely right. I uh, agree totally with Alberto <clears throat> on this. Uh, but Churchill was even hoping to keep Mussolini out of the Second World War, but there he underestimated the links between German and Italian uh, uh, fascism. And, you know, basically we can summarize the period after 1917 as this, that the Russian Revolution of 1917 transformed world politics as no previous revolution had done before. And the colonial Britain, the British Empire felt threatened. Um, and there was at one point a discussion between Lenin and Trotsky, written discussion, and Trotsky said, since the European revolution has temporarily been defeated, why don't we create a corps of 30,000 anti-imperialist soldiers uh, to send them to take on the British Empire? And they were discussing these things, you know, basically uh, uh, helping the liberation movements elsewhere uh, in the world. So they threatened the existing world order. And Churchill and many others, Hitler after all, I mean, why did the German, important sections of the German bourgeoisie, all the big houses that are still here today, support the Nazis? Why did the German aristocracy turn to the Nazis? Because they felt that the choice was fascism or Bolshevism, and they preferred fascism. And the same in Italy. Uh, and um, it's very interesting in Italy that if you look at the first membership lists of the Italian fascists after 1924, you will find that there are many, many, many Jewish, big, rich Jewish businessmen who were part of that party for exactly the same reason. And had Hitler not been obsessed with the Jews, they would have had the same thing in Germany. So the hostility to the Bolsheviks are very much a class thing. Uh, they, the, they, they threatened capital uh, and they threatened the acquisitions of capital in the rest of the world. And so they had to be defeated. And if that meant allying with the fascists, yes, so be it. I mean, that was the general line of the European right throughout Europe, which is why France collapsed without a fight in the Second World War which is why the entire Tory party was keen on a deal with the Germans. Uh, it's because they were part, they said the fascists are not, we are not like them, but they are on our side. And they weren't wrong. Okay, I was going to take Riyad Akbar, but I think he's now just left us, just as I was about to ask him to, to, to ask his question. Um, are you there? No, okay, well, I think oh. Oh, yes, you are here. Sorry. I'll ask your question. That, thanks for this great opportunity. Brilliant talk, Tarek. So, yeah, you began by saying, you know, um, amongst the many reasons for writing this book is um, uh, that uh, um, radicals, who I assume you mean um, critics of, um, younger critics of um, anti imperialism, people who've been thrown up by the Black Lives Matter movement perhaps they're lacking a bit of a political education, particularly in the class struggle. And I wondered whether, um, what had been the response to your book, given that was one of your... Um... I don't know is the honest answer. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't put it so patronizingly. I mean, I wrote the book as a sort of help uh, to the young uh, anti-imperialist decolonizers that have sprung up on different campuses in Britain, and I hope it is helpful. But as to how many of them are reading my book, I don't know. I know I've spoken to a lot of podcasts and uh, etc. On, on the net, which I assume many of them listen to. But the book is selling reasonably well. I think the right-wing attacks on it have boomeranged. Because since the liberal press hasn't reviewed the book at all, neither The Guardian nor The Observer, nor its equivalents in Scotland, uh, people wouldn't have known that the book was even published had it not been for the right. So I am grateful to them for that. Uh, thanks very Thank much. Um, and thanks everybody for their questions. Any final comments, Harry? Uh, 
No, uh, I've been, you know, very nice having this discussion and answering uh, a wide range of questions from Italy, from uh, Yugoslavia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, just the one thing I want to say is that the uh, uh, book has become a big discussion point in the Arab world, mm -hmm. uh, where Churchill is, of course, well known uh, for his uh, role in that particular world. But apart from that, uh, I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, I was, one thing I will say, that I was wanting to pay enormous tribute to the communist historians group that sprang up in Britain in the 50s and 60s. Uh, with, you know, some marvelous works being done. A communist historians group that included Edward Thompson, Christopher Hale, Victor Kiernan, uh, Raphael Samuel, many, many others who more or less transformed how history was studied. And even when the backlash began, they never could seriously challenge much of the work that had been done by the communist historians group and by them in their afterlives when the group no longer um, uh, existed. And that is the sort of history which they now want to completely write out of the picture, which is why the fact we still have a socialist historians group uh, is not, you know, is, is, is extremely important. Well, thank you very much, Tarek. Thank you for your talk and for that uh, tribute to our, to our history and our predecessors. Um, if I can just say, uh, please join the Socialist History Society. Uh, details on joining it are on the web. I don't think not all of you are, are members of the society yet, so do take this opportunity. Uh, you get two occasional publications a year, uh, two copies a year of our academic journal, Socialist History, our newsletter, and of course, all the notifications of our talks come, which are online for the time being, but hopefully we'll get back into the real world at some stage. Um, but Zoom does obviously have the advantage of allowing people to join us from all over the world, rather than meeting in a basement in Red Line Square, which is quite limited. So do join our organisation, uh, participate in the continuing history of socialist uh, history. Um, we still have a role to play, as Tariq set out, especially in these challenging times. So thanks to Tariq and thanks to everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah, this is being recorded, so it will be available. Cheerio. And I should have said um, Tariq's book is available for £15 on the Verso website, a 40% discount. Right, thanks to everybody. I shall close the meeting now if that's, uh, yeah, that's okay. Yes, so Duncan. And thanks for hosting as always.